In this episode, we're going to take a look at how to administer Microsoft Exchange Online from the beginner's perspective. So everything that you need to know to get you up and running. So you're ready to learn. Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. Andy Malone, Microsoft MVP. So nice to see you. Now, please excuse the audio uh, and video uh, here. I'm currently on vacation, so I'm not in my regular studio. So please forgive me for that. Now, um, in this episode, I thought I would take a look at Microsoft Exchange Online. And I've just been thinking, you know, this is something that I've not looked at for quite some time. And there's quite a few changes. Now, in this episode, I thought it would be really from the beginner's perspective. So if you're going to be responsible for administering Exchange Online, then I thought this would be the perfect guide to take you through everything that you need to know in order to get you up and running and ultimately master to this great technology. Now, um, if you've not subscribed to the channel, we love subscribers. So bump that subscribe button up there, ring that bell and come and join our great learning community. And if you enjoy the video, then please bump the like button. It really does make a difference to the channel. Now, questions and comments, of course, as ever, just get those down below and I, I will always uh, do my best to answer them for you. So I think without any further ado, let's jump in and I've got some cool demos here. So I hope you enjoy. So just before I get started, it's super important, first of all, that you make sure that you're on the correct plan for Microsoft Exchange Online. Now, this all really starts when you come into produce, you know, choosing your Microsoft 365 plan. Now, please note that you can choose, and Microsoft are very clever at marketing this, you can obviously just purchase Microsoft Exchange online plans, but typically you're more likely to purchase an Office 365 or a Microsoft 365 plan. Now, you can see here, I, I get so many questions from people saying, you know, there's features that are available that are not available. So it's really important that you understand this. So we have Business Basic, which is really super basic. It's just basically a mailbox. It does have a number of limitations. Now, with all business plans, you are limited to to 300 users. So that's super important to know. Um, with business standard, again, the thing about this is you get the 50 gig mailbox. You do get some features. Um, you get things like registration, reporting tools, managing uh, appointments and things like that. Um, with business premium, you do get some of the advanced security features. You get access and data control. And again, you get the security, so the kind of endpoint uh, security stuff. Um, now, if I just scroll down here and, and compare this to the various enterprise plans, the key thing to note that from the E3 and above, um, this is actually giving you Exchange Plan 2. Now, Exchange Plan 2 includes, and uh, basically the difference is, Exchange Plan 1, you really only get a 50 gig mailbox. And, and it says Microsoft are quite clever here. Messages, you can send messages up to 150 meg. Although by default, you should know that it's set to 35 meg, but you can update that if you want to. Um, if you have Exchange Plan 2, some of the key things here, you also get uh, enhanced archiving capabilities. You get a 100 gig mailbox for each user. And the key, the key thing is you also get some enhanced voicemail capabilities. Now, of course, you do need to have an E5 plan for that or a voice subscription for Microsoft Teams for that. Um, key things as well, you also get data loss prevention and you can also, with a plan two, you can actually put this account on legal hold as well. All right. Um, now, um, so that's the exchange plan, the difference between plan one and plan two. So the key thing here is you can place users on legal hold. Um, and again, these are all included in the E3s and above there as well. So those being the plans, let's dig in to Exchange Online. 
So kicking off here in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center, there are really two portals that are important to us. The first one is the Microsoft 365 Admin Tools. So users and teams and groups, and ultimately, of course, we're gonna scroll down and we're going to go into Microsoft Exchange Online. So here we have a number of these cards and they give you general information about what's happening in your Microsoft Exchange uh, environment at the moment. And of course, you can customize these as well to provide different reports. And you just simply drag and drop these uh, if you want to. Um, you can, of course, go into dark mode or you can go into light mode, whichever you prefer. So the first port of call that I'm going to come and look at then are recipients. And you can see that we have a number of recipients in Microsoft 365. You've got mailboxes, you've got groups, resources, and you've got contacts. Now, contacts are typically what we call mail-enabled users. That means that they're, they're mail-enabled, but not necessarily mailbox-enabled in your environment. So if I go into mailboxes here, these are typically user accounts. And if I go back into 365 to just show you this, um, if I come into my users and active users, these are my users that are currently licensed and your users who are licensed will of course receive a mailbox so i've got a user here called uh, adele now one of the first questions i normally get is andy how do i create a mailbox well you'll notice here that in uh, microsoft exchange online you can't create a mailbox you have to create users and once you create a user, you can then create a mailbox. So for example, um, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna create a new user here. And I'm, uh, of course, a Game of Thrones fan. So I'm gonna create a, a user called Jon Snow. Now, Jon Snow, of course, um, just put in a username for him. So Snow W, sorry, Snow J, I should say. And you can see that it says, hey, okay, here is the account. I'm going to create a password for him and I'll just click next. Now, at this point, it's asking me, hey, do you want to go ahead and create a license for this? Now, of course, a mailbox requires a license. So I'm going to come in. I'm going to say, yeah, I want to create an E5 license. I'm going to do EMNS because this provides all the mobility and the security. I'm also going to go ahead and assign John a Windows license as well. Um, I'm going to click next. And again, I, in here, I'm going to say I, I don't want to create um, an admin access for John. I can put in a department, of course. So I'll put him in sales. Um, I'm going to say, OK, which city is John in? So I'll say he's in Oslo. And I'm going to click on next. OK, now that I've done that, I'm going to click on add there. Now, what this will now start to do is it will now go off and it will start to create a mailbox for John. So if I scroll down here, you can see that uh, I have now created a user account for John. John is now licensed. And if I click into here, you can now see that John has a mail tab. Uh, and you can see here that it does take a little bit of time. So we'll come back and you'll see those uh, exchange settings uh, later. So going back into Exchange Online, if I just refresh this page, it can take a little bit of time for that mailbox to appear. Uh, so typically, um, you know, it doesn't it takes about 10 minutes or something. It's not too it's not too long now. Um, one type of mailbox that you can create in the Exchange Admin Center is something called a shared mailbox. Now, please note that you can uh, create a shared mailbox in a number of ways. So, for example, if I have a user here called Christy, and if I go into Christy's mailbox here, I can scroll down here and you can see it's giving me some uh, details about this user account. Um, it you know, shows me the type of account that she's got. And you can see this is all being picked up from Microsoft 365. Again, you've got the organization tab. 
Um, you've got the delegation tab here, which I'll come back to in a second. And you've also got the mailbox information here as well. So for example, you can set message size restrictions. So just at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that you can have messages up to 150 meg. You can see that here, but by default, check it out. It's actually set um, with the attachments or the mail messages um, to 35 meg. So one of the things that you might want to do is you might want to increase that to 150 meg. Um, so that's quite sneaky how they do that. Um, now, in addition to that, in just go back into Christie's properties. The other thing that you can do here is you can hide the user's mailbox. Um, now, you, there are a number of reasons why you might want to do this. Maybe the user hasn't quite joined the company yet or the changing departments or they're, they're just not ready. Or maybe it could be like a senior management that doesn't want to be part of, a, of an entire corporate mailing list. Um, you can also forward. So I can set up email forwarding here. So if this user is moving department or changing location, you can forward that email to somebody else. We also have a permission here called send on behalf of, and you can get access to the same thing here in the delegation tab. So we in the delegation tab, you've got three options. So you can choose send as. So if you are an assistant to somebody, I can come in here and I can actually add a member. And the key thing is that when your assistant sends messages from here, they actually send it as you. So it looks like it's actually coming from you. Send on behalf of. So again, if I added a member here and let's say I brought in Adele, then Adele was an assist, she's my assistant. But when she sends messages, it would send from Adele on behalf of Andy. Get the idea? So that's what send on behalf of is. And again, it can take a little bit of time to load up this. You've also got read and manage full access. So full access also includes the rights to change permissions. So again, that means that they can delegate the mailbox. They've got full access to the mailbox. So those are three super important settings. Um, in the mailbox tab here, you can also see that we have a number of different options. Uh, I mentioned the message size restrictions. You've got mail forwarding here, which is the same as up here. You've also got delivery restrictions. Again, the thing about delivery restrictions is, um, for example, you know, you might be in a school. Um, so do you want the kids to be able to send to everybody or only selected users within the organization? Yeah, get the idea. And you can also block messages from um, certain senders as well. So you, as I said, you've got this allow and block list there. And this is a very simple form of message rules. Now, in addition, um, if I scroll down, um, you can see that we have some sharing policies and role assignment policies. I'll come back to that in a little while. We also have something called the retention policy. So for more detail on retention policies, uh, check out my playlist on Exchange Online and you'll see that there. Um, we also have some other tabs here as well. Um, for example, if you want to add custom attributes, if you want to set up automated replies. So, you know, when anybody sends a message to a mailbox, it will send up an, an automated reply. So these are important features here. And you can see that this particular user, of course, she's got an exchange plan too. So again, I can place her account on what we call litigation hold. And litigation hold, I mean, this could be for operational reasons, or it could be the fact that you're doing it as part of a, a legal investigation. And essentially, this litigation hold prevents the user from deleting uh, any items from that mailbox. Now, the one thing that you can also have is you can create what we call an archive. And this is particularly useful in parts of plan two. Business users can also have this 
and this is sometimes a little add-on that you can purchase but it's i mean it's pennies it's not much and essentially you see it create you can create a folder and um it's a, you can basically users can store additional uh, content within that folder and it's available uh, for them so those are some of the the mailbox properties so now I come to the topic of shared mailboxes, and these are super useful for collaboration purposes. However, before you begin, you should know that there are a number of limitations uh, to the shared mailboxes. So first of all, licenses. Um, if your mailbox or your shared mailbox is unlicensed, then you can have a 50 gig storage limit. And um, if you want more than that, you need to assign a license or have a user within the mailbox that is licensed. And in that case, you can have a 100 gig limit and you can then also use in-place archiving. And in addition, you can place the mailbox on legal hold. So just really, really important. Again, there are a number of limitations, subscription requirements. So I would check out this uh, document on learn.microsoft.com. Okay, so how do we create a shared mailbox? You can do this in one of two ways. So here you can see I've got a user called Deborah. And I can either do one of two things. I can either convert her mailbox. So as I select her account, you can see it says convert shared mailbox. And it says, are you sure you want to do this? Yes, I am. So I can now convert from a regular type of mailbox to a shared. Now you can also do this in the Microsoft 365 admin center. In addition, you can also use PowerShell here as well. And if I go into Deborah's properties now and go into her mailbox, you can see that this is now a shared mailbox. And you can also see the same thing here as well. Now, converting it back is super simple. Again, you can either use the various admin centers, you can use PowerShell, and you can click onto this little ellipse up here, click onto that, and you can see convert back to a regular mailbox. So I'll simply go ahead and I'll confirm that, and it's now converted back. So again, super simple. So shared mailboxes, really useful um, for basic email collaboration. Now, as well as creating or uh, converting a mailbox, as I said, you can also create a mailbox as well. So let's have a quick look now at creating a shared mailbox. So I'm going to create a shared mailbox and we'll simply call this sales. We'll put in our basic domain at the moment. Again, you can put in a, a, an alias. You can change this anytime, by the way, any email address, any group email address, uh, you can change this anytime. And you can see that this is now added a shared mailbox. Now, do remember, go to that learn.microsoft.com to learn all about the various limitations of shared mailboxes. For example, the number that you can have, um, how many, you know, how many members and so on. Now, here you can see I've now created the details. I can now add in some users. So do I want to add in some members for this mailbox? So I'm going to add in Adele. I'm going to add in Alex and I'm going to add in Alan here. And again, I'm going to just say, yep, yeah, that's fine. I'm going to save that and I'm going to confirm that now and those users will now be added to my shared mailbox. So um, if anybody emails sales, any of those users will now receive that message. Right, the next thing that I'd like to talk about then are groups. So in groups here, you have got the option, of course, to create different types of groups. And this is one that's slightly different to Microsoft 365. If I go into groups here and teams and groups, you can see that we have four options here. So in Microsoft 365, it's all about how much collaboration do you want? So you can have a security group, which of course doesn't have any collaboration. It's just purely for permissions, assigning permissions. 
you can have a male enabled security group. So this is just a, a security group that's part of a mailing list, a distribution list. It doesn't have a mailbox. You can have a distribution list, a contact list, and for the ultimate form of collaboration, you can create a Microsoft 365 group. Now, please note that um, I just showed you shared mailboxes. A shared mailbox is the most minimum type of collaboration, and it's just for a mailbox. But if you want a fully collaborative experience, then you can create a Microsoft 365 group. And this gives you the benefit of not only having um, a shared mailbox, but you also get a shared calendar, SharePoint site, uh, SharePoint um, document library, which is like your own OneDrive, uh, as well as various other Microsoft components. So for here, I'm going to call this, this is my Sterling Sales. And uh, in here, I'm going to click on Next. You can also add an owner to the group here as well. So the owner, um, I can add in a, a admin if I want to. Um, the owner can add in other members to the group. And I can also add in members here as well. So for example, I'm just gonna add in a few members here and I'm gonna click on add. So click on next. And again, you can change the, uh, the name of the group as well if you want to. You can change the email of, uh, address of the group. So um, <coughs> again, I'm going to, what did I call this? I called it Sterling Sales. So I'm just gonna put in here the group address of Sterling Sales. And as I said, you can change this anytime that you want, by the way. Now, one thing that we can do is because the plan that I'm using is an E5 plan, um, I've also got labeling and classification here. So I can assign a sensitivity label. Um, I can also choose if I want to make the group discoverable. So remember, users can also create groups from within Microsoft Outlook. So public means that anybody can discover those groups, whereas private means it's only for the members of the group. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to create public. Now, you can see here, it's saying, do you want to extend the group to basically make it a Microsoft team. So with this, um, I mentioned that the Microsoft 365 group just has Microsoft apps, but you can extend this to become a Microsoft team and get access to tools like chat and so on. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create that uh, group or team now. So there you have it, Sterling Sales is now created. So the next thing I want to take a look at then are resources. Now resources in Microsoft Exchange and Microsoft Outlook are super useful. Now these are a special type of resource that can either be a room or a piece of equipment and particularly useful in Microsoft Teams because you can schedule the meeting room, for example. So again, you can see here some that I've made earlier. So if I go into conference room Adams here, you can see you get the same kind of exchange uh, properties, but in addition, you also get a booking tab here. So you can book delegate settings. So for example, who is allowed to book? So I can come in here and I can say, accept or decline all the requests automatically, or select an attendee or a certain delegate that can actually accept the request. So for example, if there's an assistant or somebody like that. In addition, you can also control the booking options. So things like whether you want to allow repeated meetings or allow scheduling only during working hours. Um, again, you can put in a booking window, which the default is six months. And you can also, what's the maximum duration for the booking? So again, it's 24 hour period. You can put some notes and a, a little message here that the, the, the booking uh, person or the recipient will receive. Um, so as I said, you can book that. Super useful. You can do this for both resources and you can also do this for equipment as well. So for example, a projector or something like that. So the resources, super useful. 
Now the final type of resource or recipient, I should say, is a contact. And there are potentially two types of contact. So a male contact is essentially um, a, not a mailbox user. So this is somebody external to the organization, could be a supplier, could be a, a partner, something like that. And essentially they're external to your organization. So they have no mailbox within your organization. So again, just an external contact. The other type is something called a mail user. Now, this is somebody that's within your organization. So again, you can assign a license to this user, but the key difference is that they have an external mail address. So they've not got a mailbox within your organization. So again, you may want to assign, for example, one of the F plans or um, a license that doesn't need a mailbox. And um, it could be a contractor or, or somebody like that. So that's the differences between those two types of uh, contacts. So what's next then? Let's take a look. So next we have something called mail flow and this is super important. So here, this controls how mail flows in and out of your organization and it contains a number of different elements. So you can see that message trace, we have a tool here called message trace and essentially this is a querying tool. Um, so, for example, if you're having a problem sending a, a message to a, a, a recipient, you can test it here. You can create queries. So if a um, message is sent from your organization, if they get stuck or if something goes wrong, so if a sender is having a particular problem, um, you can say, hey, you know, uh, what's causing that problem? It could be a routing problem or something like that. Um, remote, then we've got rules here. So with rules, um, a rule is essentially, you know, in Microsoft Outlook, if you receive a piece of junk mail, you know, you can right click it and you can choose to send it to your uh, deleted items container and things like that or reject it. Well, this is similar to that, except on uh, an enterprise scale. So this basically affects every single user. So, for example, do you want to apply a disclaimer to your emails? Do you want to create a, a new custom rule? Do you want to uh, assign Office 365 message encryption policies and rights protection? So if you've got a plan to uh, exchange, you can assign that. Um, you can forward messages, send messages through a moderator. For example, there's lots of different rules and they're really easy to kind of configure. Um, in terms of controlling the flow of mail, the default you can see is an asterisk. So that means you can send messages basically to anyone, anywhere. But if you didn't want that, if you wanted to say, hey, you know, if you were in a school and you only wanted to route the mail through a specific domain, so mycompany.com, then you could add that in. And in other words, it won't route through any other organization. And then it won't route through any other means. Um, likewise, you've also got accepted domains as well. So our little company here, basically it's accepting mail from anyone. But if you want to, again, customize that, you can do. How do you customize it? Well, you can add a connector. And a connector is particularly useful if you've got internal email systems. So, for example, on-premises systems such as Microsoft Exchange or other third-party solutions. So you can add connectors that will essentially either connect to other Microsoft 365, your Microsoft Exchange a mail server, or maybe even a partner organization. Um, what else have we got? You can set up alerts as well. So if there are any kind of issues going through here, it will alert you and you can then investigate those. And you create those alerts through something called an alert policy. So the alert policy basically is a set of rules. And you can see that we have a number of kind of default ones here. 
So I can simply go in, I can, you can see what this policy actually does, and I can click on the settings, and send, essentially it says send notifications uh, on a daily basis. So for example, if I receive an email from somebody, then send uh, an alert. Now, um, what, what's next? Okay, so the next thing that we have here is uh, roles. And you have got these admin roles in Microsoft 365, as well as Microsoft Azure as well. Now, typically Exchange has a number of specific admin roles. So you can have an administrator who's responsible for managing your Microsoft Exchange infrastructure. Now, in addition, you can see that we also have other roles. So for example, if you need somebody to be a compliance admin, or a um, discovery, somebody who deals with e-discovery. You can add them either in here or through the roles and admins in either the Azure Admin Center or Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Um, what else have we got that's really crucial? Well, you've got the Migration tab here. And essentially, the Migration tab um, is your means of migrating content either in or out. Now, to be honest, I don't have a migration here at the moment, but just to quickly talk about these different solutions. So I can give this um, migration a name and I can determine, am I gonna migrate in or out of Exchange? So if I'm migrating into Exchange Online, I simply click on Next and there are a number of options that you can choose. So a remote move migration is essentially exchange hybrid. And that means that you have a hybrid server on premises. And this hybrid server essentially acts as a gateway. So when you're migrating users to the cloud, it almost acts like a, an additional server on the network and it makes Microsoft 365 and Exchange Online appear as if it's just another server on your network and it's great for moving large numbers of users. You can also do what we call a staged migration and this is quite useful if you're migrating users in batches. A cutover migration is for small business. So if you've got a small number of users that you want to migrate over a weekend, for example, you click, you click on start and it migrates everything across. It creates the user accounts in 365 and it also migrates all the content. Now, if you've got um, things like multiple tenants, you can also do a cross tenant migration. And this is something I'm going to look at in the not too distant future, by the way. In addition, you've also got third party solutions, and these can either be Gmail or what we call an IMAP migration. An IMAP migration just brings email across. It doesn't bring um, things like diaries or anything like that across. And for that, you could use something called a PST uh, migration or personal store migration. Anyway, for more details on this subject, then definitely check out learn.microsoft.com as it's super useful. Um, what else have we got? You've got mobility, of course. Um, again, mobile device access. I've covered this previously in a number of sessions. Check out my Exchange playlist for that. We've also got a number of reports that you can go in and view. These include things like migration reports, mail flow reports, uh, and again, you can uh, have a look at those uh, various reports there. Um, Insights is quite nice. It gives you an idea of how heavily your users are using your systems. Of course, in this example, I'm not using anything. This is not live at the moment. Public folders. Um, these are a, uh, something that was used in the 1990s and the early noughties. Typically, you don't really get those now. But one thing that you can do if you were migrating these into 365, you can convert these into Microsoft 365 groups, by the way. Um, I'm often asked, Andy, how can I share my calendars um, with partner organizations? And this is where you would do it. This is called organizational sharing. And this is 
brilliant for things like sharing calendars here. Again, check out learn.microsoft.com about inter-organization inter calendar sharing. We also have a number of add-ins as well. Uh, these can be uh, through the Microsoft third-party uh, providers here, so you can add in. Uh, you'll notice, by the way, that some of these interfaces are legacy. So again, some of these have been moved into the add-ins page in Microsoft 365. So there you have it, Microsoft Exchange Online. I hope that you're a little bit wiser now and that you really enjoyed that session. Now, if you did, bump the like button, of course, it really does make a difference. And questions and comments, of course, as ever, just get those down below. Now, if you've not subscribed, well, help, come on on board. We love subscribers. So bump the subscribe button, ring that bell, and come and join my uh, great learning community. All right. That's it for this time. You stay safe and I'll see you soon. Take care. Hey, thanks so much for dropping by today. Here's a couple of videos that you may enjoy. And while you're here, go ahead, click on the subscribe button and you won't miss out.